USCIS will impose much higher fees on companies with more than 50 employees that have at least 50% of their workforce in H-1B and L-1 status. USCIS states in the final rule it has reinterpreted the law to impose an additional $4,000 fee, not just on initial H-1B petitions, and a $4,500 fee on initial L-1 petitions, as is the current practice laid out in the statute, Public Law 114-113. USCIS will also impose the fee for extensions when the fraud prevention and detection fee is not collected, which means, in practice, the fee will be required whenever an employee's status is extended. The change in how DHS interprets the applicability of Public Law 114-113 fee is unreasonable and runs contrary to clear statutory language, including the 50-50 fees should apply only to petition filings where the fraud prevention and detection fee is also required, said Vic Goal, managing partner of Goal and Anderson, in an interview. Curiously, the agency dismisses these concerns, but fails to state a valid substantive basis for why DHS now disagrees with its own prior guidance. We can guess. <laughs> we can guess very easily. Those of us who watch this show regularly, and or do the show, like myself, uh, have no problem figuring out why they suddenly changed their mind on this and think that it's okay to charge this money. Okay. Other high-skilled employment visas. USCIS has increased several high-skilled visa petitions by more than 50%. Petition for O visas, extraordinary ability slash achievement, would rise by 53% from $460 to $705. Fees would increase by 51% for 460 to 695 for petitions for the TN, or NAFTA professionals, E, treaty traders and investors, and P, athletes and entertainers, Q, cultural exchange, and R, religious workers categories, as well as for H3 visas for training. USCIS has changed the current I-129 form, now used for multiple categories, and renamed the forms based on the visa type. Premium processing. Uh -huh. USCIS proposes a change to change premium processing, the cost will remain the same. However, USCIS will now process a case within 15 business days rather than the current 15 calendar days. That means it will take up to four days longer for employers to receive decisions when paying the additional 1,440 premium processing fee. H-2A and H-2B visas. The current fee for H-2A, or seasonal agricultural, and H-2B, seasonal non-agricultural petitions, is $460. USCIS proposes to raise the fee for H-2A to $850 and H-2B to $715 for petitions with named workers and limiting an application to 25 workers. Cost for employers will likely rise substantially, note business organizations, since H-2A and H-2B petitions can now list 100 or more workers. Increasing costs for international students, adjustment of status, an application for employment authorization, or an I-765, for international students on optional practical training, or OPT, and others, non-DACA, will rise 34% from $410 to $550. DHS stated it declines to make changes in this final rule in response to the comment that the proposal would further disincentivize foreign students from studying in the United States. While nominally the cost of filing form I-485 for adjustment of status decreased by $10, ooh, the American Immigration Lawyers Association, or AILA, pointed out in comments to the proposed fee rule that applicants would see a substantial cost increase because USCIS would now charge separate fees for three related forms, I-485, I-765, and I-131 for a travel document. <sighs> Increased costs to become a U.S. citizen and apply for asylum. Mm. USCIS would increase the cost of the application, N-400, 
to become a U.S. citizen by more than 80%, rising from $640 to $1,160 for online filings, although a separate $85 biometrics fee would be eliminated. USCIS would also become one of the few countries in the world. Wait a minute. <laughs> USCIS is not a country. Uh, USCIS, United States, would also become one of the few countries in the world to charge an individual for applying for asylum, $50, and raise the cost for an asylum applicant to apply for an employment authorization document, or EAD, from the current zero to $490 one of many policy changes to discourage potential asylum applicants. DHS commented, quote, DHS does not believe that the EAD fee is unduly burdensome for asylum seekers. Well, of course it doesn't. Uh, this is madness. This is insane. Okay. USCIS fiscal mess. The final rule does not dwell on what critics believe is historic mismanagement of USCIS over the past three and a half years with the agency going from a substantial surplus to a deficit so severe that USCIS has requested a $1.2 billion bailout from Congress. USCIS reaped billions from slow processing. USCIS is in financial trouble even though between FY 2014, or financial year 2014 and financial year 2019, to avoid slow processing by the agency, employers paid $2.39 billion in premium processing fees, according to USCIS data obtained via the Freedom of Information Act. Freedom of Information Act, or FOIA. Jonathan Wasden, an attorney with Wasden Banai, filed the FOIA and shared the data. If you don't upgrade to premium, the agency will take up to a year to make a decision at current rates, said Wasden in an interview. If you do upgrade, you may get a decision in 15 days. It's almost like the agency is intentionally slow rolling the adjudication of these petitions as a way of extorting money from companies for premium processing. Reasons for the USCIS financial mess. Representative Zoe Lofgren, chair of the House Judiciary Subcommittee on Immigration and Citizenship, held a July 29, 2020 oversight hearing that helped explain how the Trump administration caused the financial problems at USCIS through its policy choices on immigration. Quote, Under the Trump administration, USCIS has issued a flurry of policies that make its case adjudications more complicated which reduces the agency's efficiency and requires more staff to complete fewer cases, testified Doug Rand, a founder of Boundless Immigration and a senior fellow at the Federation of American Scientists. There are dozens, if not hundreds, of such policies. Rand listed the three most consequential policies as mandatory interviews for employment-based green card applicants, some 122,000 per year, for family members of refugees and asylees applying for a green card from some 46000 per year, and for recently married couples who have already obtained a green card over 166000 per year. The elimination of the prior deference policy that now requires USCIS officers to scrutinize hundreds of thousands of skilled workers' renewal applications each year, even if nothing material has changed since the initial adjudication and, of course, the public charge rule. Shavari Dalal Daini of AILA noted these policies in her testimony and added others, including the unprecedented issuance of duplicative and irrelevant, irrelevant requests for evidence and improper denials. The RFE, Requests for Evidence Rate, reached 60% for H-1B petitions in the first quarter of financial year 2019. That is not inside information. It is written into the policies and procedures that have erected an invisible wall over the past few years that has purposefully made it more complicated, longer, and harder to get an immigration benefit, says Dalal Daini. On the day of the USCIS oversight hearing, the House Judiciary Committee also held a hearing at which members of both parties criticized leading technology companies for their market power. However, U.S. consumers can use a social network other than Facebook, buy goods from Walmart rather than Amazon, 
and purchase a phone from a company other than Apple. If U.S. employers want to sponsor workers or foreign-born individuals want to become American citizens, they have no choice but to deal with U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services, an entity that exercises its monopoly power every day of the year. And to that, I'm going to drink a drink of water. So, uh, we spoken about this before, but this is far more detailed about uh, the whole process and what the Trump administration is doing, has been doing, um, in order to make life more difficult and make immigration more difficult across the board. And it's all legal because it doesn't require any changes in laws. So it's one of the ways that they're working around existing rules and laws and just uh, muddying things and complicating them and messing them up so that people just don't want to mess with it and won't want to come here. And that's all part of their uh, larger anti-immigration push that they've been doing since day one and will continue to do until we remove them at the ballot box, which will hopefully happen soon. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I don't know what else to say about that. We've spoken about that at great length. It's just, it's a mess, and it's getting messier. Uh, it's all stuff that takes place sort of under, behind the radar, however you want to put it, um, that most people don't see and aren't aware of, That, but that those of us who are more involved in with immigrants and with the whole process are keenly aware of and have been complaining about for a long time. So anyway, moving on. This next thing is something that is very interesting to me that I had not heard of before. And um, I thought I would share it with you because it's, it's entirely new to me. And uh, I'd like to know more about it, and perhaps you would too. This is an article also from Forbes entitled Blended Capital for Immigration Bonds, Introducing the Freedom 100 Fund. <clears throat> It reads as follows. While finance to many might conjure a boring system of transactions or a dangerous game of capitalist exploitation, do financial activists, investment vehicles are fair game for creative and exciting innovations toward liberation. One area of continuous advocacy is the abolition of bail, which forces countless individuals charged with civil crimes to remain in jail simply because they cannot afford their own release. Often the over-incarcerated and their loved ones have to turn to bail bond companies that exploit the vulnerability of their financial situations, charge exorbitant interest, and require collateral in exchange for the funds needed for bail. According to the Prison Policy Institute, over 465,000 people are held in local jails every day without being convicted of a crime simply because they can't afford their bail. Bail isn't just part of the criminal justice system. You might be surprised to hear that it exists in the immigrant detention system, too. Except that in this context, it's referred to as immigration bond. That's right. Take a second to wrap your head around this. Despite committing what should be a civil, not criminal, infraction, immigrants who cross the border seeking a better life are asked to pay bond. Tens of thousands of children and adults are in this position on any given day, stuck in immigrant prisons and jails for years, with the costs of bonds ranging from $1,500 to $250,000. Immigrants and their family, families often cannot afford to pay bond. Numerous bail funds, like the Bail Project, New York's Free Them All for Public Health, and LA's People's City Council Freedom Fund, have historically helped address the criminalization of poverty in the U.S., and advocates have been working to end cash bail entirely. In the wake of mass arrests of protesters around the country in support of the movement for black lives, many bail funds have experienced an unprecedented surge in financial support, but there have been less attention on immigration detention. That's where Freedom for Immigrants has stepped in. Since 2010, they have supported both bond funding and critical post-release wraparound services for immigrants nationwide. 
their national freedom for immigrants. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Confusing myself. Their national hotline, the nation's largest for immigrants in detention, receives between 600 and 14,500 calls per month. They are part of a growing network of bail and immigration bond funds across the country, hosted by Community Justice Exchange. Freedom for Immigrants is a national nonprofit that has grown from monitoring, monitoring the human rights abuses faced by immigrants detained by ICE through their national hotline and network of volunteer detention visitors to also include actionable approaches for dignity, not detention. These approaches call for divestment from for-profit incarceration and investment in community-based organizations and tools like bond funds to welcome immigrants into the social fabric of the United States. The organization is now partnering with Mission Driven Finance, an impact investment firm and certified B Corporation dedicated to using finance as a tool for change, expanding access to capital and closing opportunity gaps to launch the Freedom 100 Fund. This new pilot fund aims to release 100 individuals from immigration prison, support them with their cases, and prove that it's time for the bail and bond system to go. I, the uh, person writing the story, talked with Laura Gratton, co-founder and chief community officer of Mission Driven Finance, and Christian Mansfield, co-founder and co-executive director of Freedom for Immigrants, to learn more about this bond fund, how it works, and why it's an important development for investors and activists committed to immigrate reform. So for those of us who may be new to this world, what's the current problem with immigration bonds and the criminalization of poverty in the United States that you're trying to address? And how has COVID-19 added another layer to this? So Greta the, uh, Soto Moreno, member of FI, FI Leadership Council says, on any given day, thousands of immigrants are locked up in prisons and jails as part of the US immigration detention system. The system is composed largely of people who are either newly arrived, such as asylum seekers, or those individuals who have long-standing ties to their communities here in the U.S. Individuals who flee their home countries to seek refuge in the U.S. and claim asylum at a port of entry have been subject to mandatory immigration detention since at least 1996 as a result of harsh policy signed into law by President Clinton. Those same laws expanded the list of aggravated felonies for which people like legal permanent residents and others could be detained and made subject to deportation, including many nonviolent offenses. Around that same time period, a series of tough on crime laws were passed that further criminalized communities of color. As a result, since 1996, there have been a dramatic increase in the number of people who have been sent to ICE detention. It's also important to recognize that throughout this period of time, the federal government has increased its use of criminal prosecution for people migrating. The federal government considers illegal entry a misdemeanor, while illegal re-entry is considered a felony. The family separation crisis grew out of these policies, forcing families to be split up needlessly and inhumanely. COVID-19 has added another layer of complexity and urgency to the situation. Freedom for Immigrants and other partners are focused on helping to bond out people who are in immunocompromised and medically vulnerable. We are also submitting parole requests for the release of people without paying cash bonds, but the federal government is only granting a small number of these requests. In addition, Freedom for Immigrants is tracking abuses related to the pandemic and the organized response of people inside on this real-time map. So question. How did Freedom for Immigrants and Mission Driven Finance decide to collaborate on this new initiative, using money as a tool for social change rather than a weapon for exploitation? Well, when we met Freedom for Immigrants and grasped the size and severity of the issue of immigrant detention, we knew we wanted to support their incredible work, rehumanizing a cruel system. Immigration is part of our daily lives in our hometown of San Diego where we have the most active land border crossing in the country and one in four San Diegans are born outside the U.S. 
At Freedom for Immigrants, we know human rights and immigration policy really well, but innovative finance is not our strength. It was critical to find our partners at Mission Driven Finance as they fully believe in our vision and worked within our ethical framework to co-create this fund expanding our national detention bond program. We partnered with Freedom for Immigrants to develop the Freedom 100 Fund, a first-of-its-kind opportunity to finance bonds and release 100 people from immigration detention across California and Louisiana at no cost to the individual. Once bonded out, individuals are eight times more likely to win their immigration cases. But without the ability to pay a bond, many individuals are forced to languish in immigration detention and away from their loved ones and communities and forced to navigate complex legal proceedings on their own, often in a language that is not their first. As more people have been detained and the costs of immigration bonds have skyrocketed, the median bond in California and Louisiana is $8,500, Families and community groups that previously donated money to bond out their loved ones are now strapped for cash. This is a perfect space for impact investing, amplifying limited philanthropic dollars. We chose California and Louisiana because they represent some of the best and worst jurisdictions for immigrants to win their cases, respectively. In Louisiana, 87.8% .8 of all immigration detention cases are denied whereas only 52.2% of cases in California are denied. By bonding out individuals in these two states, connecting them to supportive resources, and helping them make all their court appearances, we can demonstrate that the practice of detention isn't just inhumane and wildly subject to political bias. It's unnecessary. So how does this fund actually work, and what is the ultimate goal? The Freedom 100 Fund is designed to extend the impact of donated dollars. In a nutshell, instead of making donations directly to post bonds, donors make grants into a reserve account that absorbs some of the risk to make the opportunity more attractive for private investors who might not have financed immigration bonds otherwise. The fund is structured to leverage $500,000 in philanthropic reserve account at it least four times, unlocking $2 million of investor capital, and ultimately expand the availability of rapid free immigration bond financing. The fund lends to Freedom for Immigrants to have the money to post bond directly at ICE field offices on behalf of 100 individuals. As individuals go to their immigration court appearances and get their cases resolved, positively or negatively, the Department of Homeland Security, or DHS, repays Freedom for Immigrants, which would then repay the fund. We need every tool in the toolbox, including finance, to make a more just world. Our hope is that the Freedom 100 Fund can provide dignity and care for 100 individuals immediately and hopefully scale to serve thousands. We also want the fund to serve as a model for how an innovative finance can move the needle on some of our most difficult social and environmental challenges, and quickly. The first capital from the fund flowed to Freedom for Immigrants early in July, and they've already bonded out eight individuals. Why is this bond fund an impact investing fund instead of just a philanthropic effort? Well, as an investment firm, we like to right-size the tool to the problem. Philanthropy makes a lot of sense for providing early on that a program can work for subsidizing programs that don't have a functional market, and for taking on riskier financial positions to unlock other capital. But to fully address problems of this size, we have to mobilize more than just philanthropy. Thanks to their donors, Freedom for Immigrants has built a successful detention bond program and critical case management support. And now donors are committing to that third scenario of unlocking other capital because they need more money in this fight than donations alone. We always look for repayment pathways to see if impact investing is possible. As strange as it is, the fact that DHS repays bonds at the conclusion of immigrants' trials gave us the opportunity to explore an investment strategy with Freedom for Immigrants. Because of this fact, we were able to build this structure without burdening immigrants or their families, unlike most other bond financing. It's a highly unusual revenue source, but it's a, it is a revenue source. If the system is so wrong, how do we end it, as opposed to financing it? 
Clearly, the Freedom 100 Fund can help get people out of detention centers now, a critical outcome, but is it also enabling the system? Well, this is a critical question we must continually ask ourselves as abolitionists. Freedom for Immigrants combines direct services to people in immigrant prisons and jails with policy and advocacy to end the system completely. When we decide on the scope of our work, we always ask ourselves whether what we are doing could lead to the perpetuation of the system. The Freedom 100 Fund is a great example of this calculus. Our goal of the fund is twofold. One, secure the freedom of 100 individuals currently incarcerated only because they cannot afford to pay a bond. And two, leverage the model to advocate that the incarceration of immigrants in our detention system is entirely unnecessary and should be abolished. Paying the federal government bond is working within an unjust system to alleviate the suffering of people now, but our goal is to prevent anyone from ever having to suffer incarceration. The government justifies the system by assuming that if immigrants are not imprisoned, they will abscond and risk becoming a public charge. <coughs> Excuse me. The truth is, the immigration detention system itself is the biggest charge on the American public. Our taxpayer dollars fund this profit-driven system, enriching local governments and private prison corporations at the expense of us all. This fund will demonstrate that people are imprisoned solely because they cannot afford to pay an immigration bond. But when we are able to finance their freedom, they are able to concentrate on winning their immigration cases and comply with what the government is asking of them. We are advocating for divestment from inhumane systems of incarceration and investment in community organizations that support and welcome immigrants. Finally, how can people get involved? Who can be an investor? Anyone can donate to Freedom for Immigrants or consult with your financial advisor about whether it's appropriate for you to invest in the fund through a charitable vehicle, like a donor-advised fund at your favorite community foundation. While only accredited investors are eligible to consider a direct investment in the Freedom 100 Fund, we encourage everyone to learn more about collectively ending immigration detention by visiting Freedom for Immigrants site. Okay, so I've run out of time, but that I thought was very interesting. Um, I didn't know such a thing existed. I'm still not entirely clear on how it works. Uh, I mean, how it makes money. I, the, what I gather is that they've got this fund that supports these activities but probably invests in other things as well in order to like make money because otherwise all they're doing is taking in money giving it out and then maybe getting it back so that doesn't seem like that's going to grow into anything and be anything that uh investors would want to invest in because hey you could put a dollar in and in a year you could get a dollar back doesn't sound like uh, you know an investment vehicle, as I understand such a thing. So uh, there's must be more to it. I, I suppose they have a prospectus somewhere and you can read it, but uh, I think it's an interesting idea. And um, I'm going to look into it because, hey, if I can send them a few bucks and, and help them out, and what's the harm in that? That's great if it will help other people. Anyway, I've run out of time. I hope you... Uh, learned something or got something out of today's show and i hope you will join us again in the future until then have a great week see you later Bye.